It's in a hello and the way your smile glows. Hello and welcome to Fly With Your Shadow, the podcast all about music, mental health and illness, and the mess that the COVID pandemic has made of it all. I'm Jeff Robson, and this show comes to you from my home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. When I started this show, I really hoped to have a lot of honest and open conversations about different mental illnesses and the effects that they've had on people's lives and some of the ways that they've come to accept them. I hope that it might help to educate and inform and break down some of the harmful stigmas and fears surrounding these topics. This episode contains a really forthcoming conversation that I think is really powerful and interesting and important. It really hit home for me, and I have a feeling it will for some of you as well. The descriptions of the difficulties faced by this week's guest could be a bit of a trigger for some extra sensitive listeners, but I really hope that today's conversation leaves you feeling hopeful and optimistic if you're going through your own struggles. If, like me and this week's guest, you deal with overwhelming anxiety at times, know that you're not alone, and it's not your fault. It's not a weakness. There are supports and treatments available. Getting help is often the scariest part, but it's very worthwhile. Visiting a caring and understanding health professional is a really important step. But you can also reach out to me at flywithyourshadow at gmail.com or visit some of the resources on my website at flywithyourshadow.com if you want to find out more or if you want to talk or discuss options for you or someone you know. Now, don't let that disclaimer lead you to believe that today's episode is in any way a downer because I had a wonderful talk with someone whose music I've admired for a long time who just happens to be funny and charming and an absolute delight to talk to. Hello, I'm Megan Smith and I am a songwriter. I'm your songwriter if you want me to be. In 2008, I came across this really unique and interesting EP and DVD package called The Cricket's Quartet by Megan Smith. It contains four wonderful songs with accompanying stunning videos, including animation, costumes, and stunning visuals. I urge you to check out some of those great videos on YouTube. I'll post some of them on the show's website at flywithyourshadow.com. The melodic, interesting, jazz-influenced pop songs were from a full-length album that would soon follow called The Cricket's Orchestra. I'm in a little love and I'm in a little deep never... The album's produced by a guy named Les Cooper who produced breakthrough albums for Jill Barber, Madison Violet, Good Lovelies, and many others. His albums often have a bit of a timeless sound that could have been recorded decades ago, but with a modern clarity and quality. The songs and videos on the Crickets Orchestra feel comfortable and somehow familiar, but fresh and exciting at the same time, and they really caught my attention. The album was picked up and put out by a major label with big budgets for promotion and support. It got the kind of industry push that signifies the arrival of a significant artist with a very bright future. Somewhat unusually, the album was followed up by a Christmas album, which many artists don't release until they're well into their careers, with a proper follow-up album not appearing until Have a Heart in 2014. And then, seemingly as quickly as she'd arrived on the scene, Megan Smith kind of disappeared from public view, for the most part. Megan and her ever-present accompanist slash hus band, Jason Mingo, had been touring all over the place, and suddenly that life came to a halt. It was a long and fascinating period that's documented in an ebook that you can buy on Megan's website called How to Have a Heart. Again, I'll link to that at flywithyourshadow.com. After an ultimately joyful but painful and devastating pregnancy and delivery, Megan and Jason knew that their touring life was over and they had to come up with a new way of staying creative and earning money to live on. They launched a custom song business called Our Song where you can go and commission them to write and record a song with details and stories from your own life. These aren't novelty songs by any stretch. They're fully realized, proper songs that are impressive and powerful. 
And together, Megan and Jason have been busy writing, recording, and sharing hundreds of these songs over the past several years. Besides being a loving mother, adoring wife, and busy and successful songwriter, Megan Smith is also a painter, she designs greeting cards, and so much more. I'm so glad she found time in that busy schedule to talk to me for a while. I know that you'll really enjoy this conversation with Megan Smith. Underneath your spell, I tripped and I fell, now I'm down. A lot of us came to know you, I guess, um, man, it seems like it's been a while now, uh, the Crickets Orchestra, or, or maybe even as early as the Crickets Quartet, I think, is the first one yeah. that I got. I think that came out first. And uh, throwback. Yeah, it seemed like, it seemed like a, a pretty exciting time for you. I mean, a, lo- a lot of us were becoming aware of your music. You had this uh, you know, record contract with the big label and stuff, and they were doing cool things, like that Crickets Quartet. I was just watching that again today. It's got your amazing videos as well as some songs on mm-hmm. it. So it seems like, you know, it, it must have been a bit of an exciting time. You're winning awards oh and gosh. touring all over the place. So can, what can you tell me about, <laughs> about that time? kind of looking back at it it sort of feels like it was a dream a little bit um yeah so I like I was working as an animator when I decided to try being a musician I was like I'm gonna give myself like two or three years to try this music thing so like I made my own record like I I wrote a bunch of songs I hired a producer and players and we yeah we made the crickets orchestra and then like I couldn't even get a manager in Halifax I was like would will anyone please manage me like help me book a show and everybody was like it's a cool album but you know we don't know what what genre is it like what are you going for here so um then I went to the Halifax Film Festival and brought my music that my like newly finished CD music and gave it to a bunch of film and and TV supervisors who were from LA and then that's when things started going crazy like um so they took my music back to LA and passed it around and all of a sudden and I really mean this like it felt like overnight I was hearing like famous people were calling me like Coldplay's manager and like Sarah McLaughlin and like you know Jan Arden's manager and all these people suddenly were were aware of me and then I I got three offers from three major labels and suddenly everybody could manage me. It's so weird. <laughs> all of a sudden your calls were getting returned. All of a sudden. Yeah. All of a sudden all these people were like, yeah, we got time for you now. Anyway, so um, it just it just went from there. I signed what I thought was the fairest deal. And my husband quit his job and I hired him. He's my guitar player. And we went on the road for like 10 years. It was It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. And it was really, really stressful also for me. I mean, that, that's a lot of what kind of this particular show is about. What, what do you mean it's stressful? Like, like what was going on there? Like, obviously there's, there's some pressure when you have a, when you have a record label and, uh, some success and things like that. Is that the kind of stress you're talking about or? It's really, really hard to explain. Um, but I will do my best because I have three sisters and all of my sisters, while all of this was happening in my life, all of my sisters were having babies and at home with these little babies and some of them were working and and trying to be a mom and and or just like at home with kids and so i was like you know going from hotel room to hotel room to hotel room playing shows every night for like you know weeks and weeks sometimes months at a time and they would be like i call them and just be like i i'm i'm so stressed out all the time they're like sorry someone's making your bed for you and you're not cooking you're not cleaning and you just have to worry about like your gear and your merch and your husband and you work like 2 hours a day <laughs> they're like what is so stressful and it it was really really hard to explain um the the stress of that like I think a lot of it was pressure that I was putting on myself. You know, I I worried constantly about what were people thinking of me, which was the total opposite of my experience making my album. Like when I made that record, I didn't think about 
what anyone was going to think of it. I, I, I gave myself this gift of like, you know, you want to try being a musician, just go for it. You can do anything you want on this album. And this is your one shot. I'm giving, you know, I'm giving myself this one shot and whatever. I'll just be, I'm just like satisfied and fulfilled that I created it. If anything happens with it, that's pretty cool, but nothing has to happen with it for me to feel successful. But then when I signed a, a major label deal, all of a sudden, you know, there's the kind of money I had never seen before and I needed to I needed to pay that back. Like, you know, I, f- I felt responsible to these people at the label who were awesome, by the way, really, really supportive and kind. And, you know, I didn't have one of those big bad label experiences that a lot of other artists do but um I I was constantly worried about ticket sales and like merch sales and is my music good enough like am I writing songs that are actually does any of this really matter and I have this like existential crisis basically every night when I get off stage um you know that was the side of of touring that I, I didn't feel like I was allowed to talk about either because it, it was the same with my sisters who would be like, sorry, you're complaining about living in hotel rooms. And then the world is like, I'm sorry, you're complaining because you have a record deal and you're like supported by this label and you have a manager. And, you know, it's it was kind of like a musician's dream. So I, I really felt like there definitely was something wrong with me because I was experiencing all this, um, all this stress and you know, difficulty having faith in myself on the road, especially on the road. But also it it started to happen like in the studio with my second album too. Just to reiterate this. So, so you made that record, the crickets orchestra entirely by yourself. Like, like there was no, yeah, there was, there was nobody kind of guiding this and you just, um, put aside your, your other career to do this now, uh, approximately how old are you at this point? Like how early 20s and yeah and my my producer Les Cooper was was a total visionary as well but it it was him and I working together there was no A&R guy there was nobody overseeing anything I I had the final say you know I made all the executive decisions I guess on the album with Les so yeah there's there's nobody overseeing it except me and yeah I spent I put all my own money into it you know I invested forty thousand dollars into it which was a a huge amount for me at that stage in my life and for my husband too it was a really big sacrifice for us but I really I I had so much fun and 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 my my goal was like I I want to get to the end of my life and not and and not have given myself I I don't want to get to the end of my life and not have given myself this the chance to do this that's some great wisdom early 20s for you for you to recognize that already <laughs> and be willing to take that chance obviously you had some confidence yeah. that it was going to be well, it was going to turn out okay right like like you knew that you had the talent and you had the you had something going there so there was some faith you know, I wasn't thinking about that and I, I didn't really care about that. I was just like, I want to make the best thing I can make. And and if other people like it, awesome. And I wanted other people to hear it. So yeah, I think you're right. But I wasn't making it to impress anybody. I was I just had such a good time making it. And but after it was done, yeah, I definitely recognized that it was really special. And I was really proud of it and I did want to share it. So yeah, I did have, I did have a, a a certain amount of confidence that, that it would resonate with at least some people. But had you done shows and stuff up to that point? Like, had you done any touring or anything or was this like completely like you having done this kind of in your bedroom coming up with all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I played open mics in Halifax. I had toured. I wouldn't even, I, yeah, I guess I could say tour. I toured around Nova Scotia, which is a super small province, but, um, I had not, no, I had never played like outside of the East coast basically. Um, yeah. Before this happened. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause it's, it's such a great record. It's, it sounds like, you know, it, a lot of, uh, I guess experience must've gone into it. I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear that cause it's such a fully realized, like, great it's it's a it's a great record thank you the pl- a lot of it is the players 
a lot of it's the players too and you know less he had this he he choreographed the players and he he arranged the strings and horns i mean like you know a lot of it was him i i i basically wrote the songs and then i had a lot of ideas too like i had a lot of the vision too but it was it was really a team effort and then yeah we just hired really really fantastic musicians and we worked with really professional people and yeah it it was it was really magical that part of it was magical that i mean still i'm kind of i'm kind of amazed by this by someone who's who's not really toured that much and not really done that much to to go out on such a such a big limb like doing all of this right like people that i talk to normally their first album is kind of a lo-fi bedroom recording it's not it's not this uh fully realized strings and horns and you know big yeah. uh, sounding production <laughs> so uh, i mean uh, I, I hope that you have great pride in the fact that you came up with something great, like like right out of the box. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. You. I am really proud of that record. Yeah, I am. I love that record. Yeah, and then uh, like I said, you you got a lot of kind of attention and and success, and and things started to started to be a whirlwind. So. Uh, again, can you, can you tell me a bit more about the, like, like your family obviously didn't understand what life on the road was like. Did, did you really have a clue what it was going to be like being in those hotel rooms for that long and being away for that long? Like, like, did you, do you think you were really prepared for that? No, no. Um, no, I wasn't. And and it, it wasn't, it wasn't just that because I was, I was actually touring with my husband. And so a lot of times musicians, have issues with being away from home and away from people, but I was with my, my home. I was with my husband, but another big part of it for me was like every single show, there were only like two or three shows where this wouldn't happen is I would, I would get up on that stage and I'd feel like I was entering a boxing ring with myself and I would be trying to perform and I'd have these intrusive thoughts like, who do you think you are? You shouldn't be on this stage. You're going to screw this next part up. You always miss that note. And then of course I'd like, I'd be like, no, no, stop. Just concentrate on the lyrics. I'm like having this internal like battle. And then I'd like forget where I was in the song. So then I'm just like proving my own fears. And you know, it just was this horrible cycle. And then I'd get off, I'd get off stage. And even if I played like the, to the best of my ability, and even if people were like, complimented us on the show and even if I sold out my merch I found a way to like make it so that it was in spite of me that we were successful like it was like oh they just feel really sorry for me like that was this was a thing I I truly believed and Jason would be like this Megan you're not this isn't logical you realize this isn't logical right but if we sold out our merch I'd be like that see that's how bad I was I sold out my merch they they feel so bad for me that I sold out my merch and he's like that's that's not how people do things like <laughs> so I and on some level I was like okay I guess that's not logical but it was just what my brain was telling me uh, a lot of the reason why I wanted to talk to you, besides being a big fan of the music, is that that you've been open about having anxiety, and all the things that you're describing to me kind of hit home as exactly the same things that I do to myself, and and because I recognize that I'm a terribly anxious person, just just out of control most of the time, and I, I make I'm up so all this, these same ex- no 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 don't be sorry because I understand it now, and and I think I I think I use it. As, hopefully productively i i certainly you know i'm trying to get something good out of it my, but my point is yeah. like uh, all this sounds like someone who's who's terribly anxious were you aware of that at the time did you did you know that that was kind of what was going on with you or or it, you know is that something that you've kind of realized in hindsight i had no idea and i knew that other people like the band seem to be able to just enjoy the road and Jason would too. And we actually, it, 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 it was really fun. You know, we'd, we'd be able to see the town, you know, we were in for a little bit anyway, and then we do sound check and we play a show and hang out with the band after. And like, it should have been fun. And I could see that it was really fun for so many people. And, and I would have these like, 
just like existential crises like all the time. And it seemed like it was just me. And and that just that kept happening. And and I would explain it away like I would try and find the reason for it. And then I'd move past that reason. Like, um, you know, eventually we stopped touring because we had our family and we have our sons now. We stay home and, and uh, we don't want to be on the road with our kids. But like, I, I was like, okay, once I stopped, it's touring is what's causing it. But once I stopped touring, it was still there. So that's when I started to go, I can see that other people aren't struggling in the same ways that I'm struggling. And very slowly, like over years and years, it took a really long time for me to seek out a diagnosis and and just, you know, really actually figure out what's going on with me. I mean, at the time, it must have been... It must have been pretty scary. So, like, were you, um, were you uh, genuinely in danger of kind of quitting music at the time before even making another record? Oh yeah, like every day, yeah, every day. People would say, like, you know, you have to have a hundred percent faith in yourself and believe in yourself, and you have to want it to be in this business. And I'd be like, well, I don't know what I'm doing here then, because. I'm questioning myself all the time. So that, yeah, that was every day I'd say to Jason, like, should I, I don't, should I be like, should I just work at a bookstore or something? Like, I, I'm not sure if this is right for me. And he'd be like, oh, we have sound check in a half hour. So let's just keep going. He really, he just was like the steady, I would be up and down and all over the place. And he would just be the steady, let's keep moving forward guy and try, you know, he, he really, his job on tour was to like pick me up off the floor, and dust me off and help me along. And, you know, I, I owe a lot of my successes to him too. It's, it's such a kind of a delicate dance though, this, us anxiety ridden people and, and especially the people around us, like Jason, who care about us. There's, there's such a dance because at the same, uh, uh, on the one hand, like when I hear him, pushing you and telling you to keep doing this, I feel like, oh my God, like that must have added more pressure. But at the same time, obviously you recognize that he cared enough about you that he was helping you to do something that was good for you as well. Yeah. He would always say, if you're serious, we can quit. And I knew he meant it. We, we got together before any of this happened. We, you know, we were playing open mics together as like musical babies. So he, he is a priority over everything. And I, I believed him and I still believe him if he was, you know, he's like, if you really need to quit, we will absolutely, we'll go home right now. And I never wanted to, I really wanted to be able to get up on, I wanted to be a musician so badly so I would always say, no, let's just keep, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. Um, so he never, I don't feel like he ever pushed me. He supported me though, but there was no pushing. But yeah, it is hard for, for support people because like, unless you have experienced anxiety, it it, it isn't logical. It, it's not logical. Like a lot of my fears were completely illogical. And I knew they were, I could see that they were, and yet I couldn't stop believing them. Right. Like, and so trying to explain that to a really logical, well-balanced, even keeled person, who was like, Megan, like how many artists get a record deal? How many artists from Nova Scotia who are like female songwriters get a major label deal from a huge out, like from a huge, label and like have all these like who does this happen to and I'm like I realize that but I still can't change that I'm struggling so much with this and it he you know like people who who have to put up with anxious people are you know he's so patient and supportive and tried to understand and couldn't understand and he just you know he stayed with me and I mean yeah it's it's it's, I would be frustrated if I was him. 
I, I can say that. I would be frustrated. I was frustrated with me. I was like, there were a lot of times where I'd say to him, you know, imagine how frustrated you feel right now with me. Imagine being me. I can't ever leave or stop being me. Like, this is frustrating for me too. So, yeah. But somehow you guys persevere and, and you make uh, you make a couple more records. I mean, I mean, for, I kind of wondered, like, your second record was a Christmas record. That seems unusual too. I guess the first one made sort of with the with the contract and all that stuff was was a christmas record how how does that sort of come about yeah the, the label was like we really we need to put something out to follow up um the first album and and so they were like what what can we do kind of short term so we put out a christmas album and yeah then i needed to work on the second album which was you know just imagine having anxiety trying to follow up something really successful and and it was it was really 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 difficult but the christmas record was was that fairly i mean it's it's uh, again it's it's a pretty great thing there's some incredible guests on this thing and uh yeah and it's 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 not your typical christmas record like it's not all all the songs you're used to there's some original stuff on here and some uh yeah. you know kind of offbeat stuff so so was that kind of a less pressure way of of coming up with something I guess yeah it was that was also a really fun project it it wasn't quite as like magical I'd say as the crickets orchestra but it was it was still really fun to do I we had a lot of creativity um creative control and yeah and it, it it's been really successful too it's funny like you know, I put that album out and a lot of people, a lot of artists put out Christmas albums now. Like, all, you know, all the artists that you're like, oh, you're too cool for a Christmas album. No, you're not because they're putting out Christmas albums. So it's like, I don't know. I kind of, I feel like I sort of hit it when it was good to do. And it's still a huge seller for me every year. I'm I'm amazed. Like, It Snowed comes on and I get messages all over the world from people who are like, I heard you at the, in the mall in Alabama or in New Zealand or, you know, wherever. Like, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, making, making the follow-up, I guess the, the official follow-up record was such an ordeal that you literally wrote a book about it. I did. I had to write a book about it just to process it. Yeah. I guess a, a lot of stuff went on in that. And like, in the end, uh, uh, again, I hope you feel like you came out out of it with something that you can be proud of and and something good. The, that album, Have a Heart, I guess that came out in 2014, right? Yeah, yeah. I am really proud of that album too. It was it was a struggle to make and had a lot of high hopes for it. it. And then, you know, my life just took like it was like the hugest plot twist. Um, after that album. So yeah, I, I remain really, really proud of that album as well. There's specific moments on there that were, were totally magical for me too. Like similar to, um, the crickets orchestra again, it felt that it felt that magical. Um, but we just, we didn't have the chance to work that one the way I worked the crickets orchestra. Do you want to talk at all about why that is like, why, why that yeah, kind of period yeah. came to a close, what happened there? Yeah, so um, we were doing a promo tour for this my second album, Have a Heart, and there's a lot of buzz about it. Like a lot of industry people were excited, and so we were we were doing this whole tour of just press um, press people coming to shows, and I started to feel really really sick on this press tour, like like with the stomach flu, and it got so bad one night um, in Toronto, one of the last nights of the tour, I couldn't stop throwing up. I threw up for like eight hours and I like, I wasn't throwing up anything. I just couldn't stop. And so my husband was like, that's it. We're going to the hospital. So we get to the hospital and they're like, you know, they asked me a bunch of questions. They're like, is there any way you're pregnant? And I was like, I don't, I don't think so. Although come to think of it, everything smells really weird now. And, and, you know, certain parts of me are like feeling weird. And I guess, I guess, I don't know. And so anyway, they did an ultrasound and, and lo and behold, um, we were going to have a baby. So 
we called my my um a and r guy my record label guy pretty much immediately and told him like we we need to go home i had to be i had to be on i v and everything um and uh Jason said, you know we need to go home and and so I ended up having a hyperemesis pregnancy, which means um I threw up for the full nine months, like people talk about morning sickness like it's this little little thing no it was it was a tr- it was traumatic. Like if you can imagine having the flu for nine months, that's basically what I went through. Every minute of every day was excruciating. Um, like everything made me want to throw up. So, which was torture because I, I at the same time I'm like ravenously hungry because I'm growing a human. So it was it was horrible. I I couldn't tour. We had to cancel a lot of things, and the label said, you know what we understand we're really excited about this record still after you have your baby you know six weeks later we got to have you back on the road and I was like yeah yeah for sure like you know I was so so um so committed to my album and to my career um and then my my labor and my delivery was like worse than my pregnancy I'll spare you the details Jeff but um (laughs) I'll take your word for it, it It was, I needed therapy after that one too. And it took eight months to recover from my delivery. So I, I, I physically couldn't walk for three months. So, you know, getting up on a stage, trying to get on and off of airplanes with a baby, like I, I, I couldn't do it. And so I, I had to tell my label, um, I can't tour. And, and Jason and I had a lot of conversations about it and he was like, you know, do you ever really want to tour again? And I, I thought back about, you know, to all of those times where I had just struggled on stage and the, the emotional torture of being on tour. And I said, no, I don't. So we told the label, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I, you know, I told the label, I'm not going to tour anymore. And they said, we're going to have to like end your contract. Cause that's, how we make money and so it it made sense I I felt a huge amount of anxiety for letting them down but I also physically couldn't carry on so yeah and so did that kind of uh, the anxiety of all that obviously that's a difficult situation and you got to kind of reevaluate what are we going to do all that all that stuff but but do you feel better about not having uh, to to try to please the label or try to try to fulfill these commitments now does does that help with some of the anxiety of that you were going through as a recording artist? Yeah, it's like I traded anxieties. So like <laughs> I traded in the anxiety of like being a high performing artist for like being jobless and being a new mom because you know without my income my guitar player producer husband has he has no work either so now we have this new baby and you know i wasn't touring that means my booking agent left my manager left like everyone left and so i had that anxiety and also a bunch of shame and embarrassment and like you know just all of this this cacophony of emo- and also at the same time i was so in love with my baby like I was, it felt like, I mean, I've never been stoned, if you can believe it, or high, but I felt high off love for this, for this baby for like the whole time. So I had these like really opposing emotions of like severe regret and shame for having like lost my whole career. But also, I just love the, I just love my baby so, so much. So it was definitely a weird time. And I, yeah, I, I feel like I traded anxiety. The difference now, though, was that my anxiety wasn't public. I didn't have to go through that on a stage or in front of anybody. I was in private. I could manage my anxiety in private now. And it's so difficult, right? Like you're going through the greatest joy that you can possibly have and, and you know, accomplishing mm-hmm. this thing, but you're still uh, obviously have a lot to worry about. You got you got to kind of shift and figure out what to do now and and all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. so, so what, I mean, what ended up, I mean, you have other talents, obviously, like you were an animator before and an artist before, right? So, um, mm-hmm. was there kind of like, well, I can just go back to doing that kind of thing or, or were you really not clear on what you were going to do? There, 
there was I was so unfulfilled working in that job um I I I did not want to go back to being an animator um and I I I didn't want to let go of music like I just felt like um I I did some artwork I did some freelance stuff and like people thought we were crazy but Jason and I, Jason and I decided to have a second child Everybody's like, we cannot believe you're doing this again. <laughs> it was so much fun the first time. Let's do it again. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, my sisters are my everything. And I thought, I, I want my little son to have a, a sibling too. So we we decided pretty, pretty soon after to, I was like, if we don't do this now, I'm going to run out of courage. So we got the second one done. It was just as bad as the first one, except... This time I had a C-section, which was awesome. So we just skipped over the whole um, horrible delivery, eight-month recovery. It was just a six-week recovery. They just sliced me open and took the baby out. I, I really enjoyed it. It was it was fantastic. So, <laughs> so here I am, though. I've got two kids. One, I've got like a two-year-old and like a three-month-old. And I could feel... I could feel like this, it was almost like there's this like black hole opening up in my life and it was kind of getting bigger and bigger. And I was like standing right next to it, looking down into it and seeing nothing and thinking, and I think that was like some form of depression. And like, you know, after everything I had been through combined with my anxiety, I, I, I can understand, like, I don't know how any woman who, who has hyperemesis pregnancies and then like a tragic delivery and the, like, I don't know how you wouldn't. Plus I've got all the hormones of a new mom. And so I, I had this very distinct moment nursing my son of being like, I can feel myself being tempted to just like, let go of everything and stop caring and that really scared me. I had never really felt that way before. So um, I decided to make like this this list of things I needed in a job for myself. Um, so I wrote down like, I need to be musically fulfilled. I need to feel like I'm helping others. I need to be, I need to do something that's like environmentally sustainable. Um, I need to employ my husband. I need to make like a certain amount a year so we can pay our bills. What? And then so then I looked at my criteria and I'm like, okay, what could that be? And it just popped into my head, custom songwriting, custom songwriting, like write, do for other people what I do for myself, which is I work through all of my own stuff through songwriting. And I thought, yeah, I, I think I, I think I could do that. Cause then, you know, like I can, I can leave my life for just a little bit. I can't actually go anywhere because I'm nursing and taking care of babies. But like, I could just leave my life for a little bit and be in someone else's life and then come back to my life. It, that would be great. So I put a, a post on Facebook offering to write a custom song and I had so many requests. And that's how it started. My my current um, songwriting endeavor called Our Song Um and I've we've been doing it for four years now. Uh, certainly, reading some some of the stuff that you went through, making that other record and stuff, songwriting wasn't always easy for you. So what what makes you think now you can all of a sudden write a song to order? You know, when somebody else wants to, like if if you had uh, obviously you've come up with a lot of great songs, but it wasn't it it sounds like it wasn't easy. You weren't the kind of person who could just sit down and write a song. Now giving yourself the challenge of now I got to sit down and write a song. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Jeff. Um, <laughs> kids really, really helps with mi forcing you to be productive. And I also was like staring down the barrel of like poverty slash, you know, having to go work at a job that I really didn't want to work at versus trying to make a go of something that I thought could really not only be beneficial to me, but like help others too. So I just, I felt so much passion and so much motivation, especially when I started hearing people's stories of like 
of like love, like, you know, every single person has an amazing story in their life. Even if you don't think you do, I guarantee you absolutely do. Every love story is so unique, especially the songs I write for like, you know, wedding anniversaries or people who are getting married. I write songs for people who have lost loved ones. Like those experiences that they bring to me with their memories of of their life with this with their loved one who's now departed like those are so fertile for songwriting and they're so precious i i just i had so much passion and it's still there i'm still passionate about it so having to so my husband and i split up the day so as soon as we started this project i i took the morning so i i get up at 5 and i work from 5 until 12 and he would have the kids because they would get up at five. Good morning, everybody. So he'd have the kids from five until 12. And then as soon as it was 12 o'clock, I took over with the kids and and I had them till five. So we split the day evenly and we both do bedtime and stuff. But so now I'm like, yeah, I, I used to write 12 songs maybe every couple years. And now I'm writing... I don't at, at least 50 songs a year. We also write songs for publishers uh, for film and TV stuff. So I do custom songwriting as well as songwriting for publishers. And it's just really, it's really amazing how if there's inspiration and if there's passion and desire, so long as I sit down with an instrument and I, so long as I show up, the songs will also, they'll meet me there. They show up too. Uh, I just want to ask about the the beginning of this though. Like the first few, was there a trial run to make sure that you could do this before you offered the service? Or was it literally like the first person who said, here's what I want, then you had to learn how to do it? No, <laughs> that would have been, that would have been smart. No, yeah. The first person was like, yeah, here's my story. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this now. I'm doing this now. That's kind of seems to be how I do things. I don't really like think things through. Um, but yeah, I, you know, what? honestly, it's, it's instinctual. Like I, I do a lot of things. Just, I just feel like I should do this. And then a lot of times it just works. So I think it was that. And also I couldn't think of any other options. So I kind of had to make it work. And then the first one, I remember the first song I wrote is called, the first custom song I wrote was called um, Good, Good Heart. A good, good heart It's gonna break and heal And you will know. And it was for this father, this really young father who had had a heart attack when he was like in his 20s, just before his, his new baby was born. And he asked me to write a song in the event should he have an actual heart attack. Um, and he would he wanted a song for his child if he wasn't there. So to leave behind. That's right. Yeah. So that was the first song I wrote. And I could so easily put myself in his place. And I think I think that's because of my anxiety. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of anxious people become very empathetic. Yes. Um, and especially if, if you're the kind of person like me, who's always, always thinking you're going to die, like every, every panic attack or every, whatever you think you're going to die and every, you know, so you've probably, you probably had these thoughts that the guys had. So maybe that was the perfect one to start with in a way. Well, you know, it's, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't think a whole lot about myself dying, um, but ever since having kids too, I, I just feel like I can so easily imagine I can put myself in someone else's shoes it's empathy it's exactly what you said and yeah I think having anxiety what anxiety what is anxiety you're just imagining a scenario <laughs> the worst case scenario you're yeah you all you're also imagining the worst case scenario I also imagine the best case scenario right like and I think that's why I became a musician and I just started this custom songwriting business I I, I can imagine I can imagine a lot of things and I I imagine myself as this father and then I spoke to my own child through his song and I gave him the song and I was lucky enough to 
be there when he and his wife listened to it. And the two of them just were just an absolute mess of tears. And, and like, I can't believe it's like you were inside my head and you, you've captured the story so perfectly. I was, I was shocked by that. Like I didn't, I didn't really realize how, how much impact it would have, which I think is, it kind of, it makes sense. Like if you imagine, um, like I can't make my own shoes. So it's like meeting someone who could make shoes for me and I'd never had shoes. I, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I have shoes now. Like I can do all these things now and I can experience all these things. And you've, you've helped me so much. It was kind of, it felt like that where he couldn't express that in his, in his own way. And he, he needed somebody to help him express that. So I, I stood in his place and helped him express it. And he was just like, so overwhelmed by this thing that I just do. I, I just, I just do this for myself. And you see, so being able to translate that into someone else's life and someone else's experience, I, I saw immediately how, um, how much meaning it had for people. And that just like, that just inspired me even more to keep going. Now there's obviously a certain, there's a certain pressure here as well, because people are paying you, they're coming to you, uh, wanting something out of it. Are, are you, uh, back then or even still now ever afraid that they're not going to like what you've come up with or they're not going to be satisfied with the result? Yeah. Every single time. Like every, every, seri- <laughs> every single time, of course. Um, you are officially an anxious person. Sure I am. But, and it's happened, it has happened a few times where people have said, this is not what I was expecting. Um, and then I, you know what, I just, I work with them. I, what, what my purpose, my purpose is to help them express what they need to express. And if I didn't capture that on the first time, I, I think it's happened maybe like three or four times out of like a hundred, a hundred songs. So that's pretty good track record. But you know, if I haven't done my job right, I really want to do that right. And so I don't, it's, I'm not offended. I see it as like good practice for just becoming better at, at empathy, better at communication, you know, better at helping people. It's it's not a problem. So it's it's really weird how I don't have any anxiety around a song for someone else. But if it was my own song and somebody was telling me like, you know, they didn't like it or whatever, I, that would be a different experience. I, I would take that like totally personally. So there's this element of separation when I'm writing for someone else that I'm able to sort of like be in the song, but also be a little bit outside of it. How much, uh, how much of this song is still you though? Like if you, if you're, if you're trying to tell someone else's story and trying to, you know, use their voice and stuff, how do you still have enough of your fingerprints on it that it's, that it's still, you know, your art and it's not just, it's well, not just you cranking out a product that people want. You know what yeah. I mean? Cause you're an artist as mm-hmm. well, right? Like you could draw, yeah. you know, polar bears or whatever that people want to see, but y- you want to create something that reflects yeah. your own feelings and stuff. So so how does this not become something that's just a product that be, it's still art that you're proud of? Well, that's a great question and that was my problem with animation. I was basically just drawing other people's ideas, right? I was cranking out storyboards and and it felt I was doing it for a paycheck. Um so the difference between that and this is that first of all, I don't take on any songs I can't understand or can't empathize with. So if if I don't relate to it or if I don't feel like it's – if it doesn't work for me, I, I, I can't do it. I, I wish I could, but I just – it's I can't. So I, I screen people. You know, it's a, a vetted process. I ask them to tell me their story first, and if I can get behind what they're wanting to say, then we move forward. And I, I also – I, I truly, truly care about people and about their experience. And I, I picture them listening to it. I picture what they'll feel. I picture the end result. And, and I remember like, you know, that father like sitting on the couch, just bawling <laughs> tears of happiness. And, and I, I want to do that to people. I want to help people that way. Um, Cause I, like I realized 
I've heard so many different stories about people's struggles and losses and loves, and everybody has different circumstances and different situations, but everybody feels the same thing. So I can virtually feel my own feelings in anybody else's circumstances. So I can relate to them. I can so easily empathize with them because I felt those severe depths and those real highs. And it's like just a matter of the circumstances that are different, but the feelings are the same. And that's what music is. I feel like music is an emotional language. I use English and I use words, but there's so much more than that. There's the instrumentation and the chords and the tempo and my performance, like my vocal performance. So there's all these different tools I have to communicate emotion. And that's what keeps us together. That's what keeps my soul inside all of these other people's experiences. But as an artist, do you, do you ever worry about it like becoming formulaic? Is is there a fear that if you keep doing this type of song, they'll start to sound the same after a while? Or, or do you not worry about that? Yeah, and that was a good that's a good point. That was a question like a lot of people have asked me that, but it goes back to every single person's story being so unique. Like I I I can't write the same song for for two people because they have such different perspectives and such different experiences and like while their emotions are the same, like they're they they see things differently they experience things differently so no it's never happened i think if i ever started to feel like i was phoning it in the way i had felt with my animation career i would have to quit the not quit you know like cold turkey like i did with that cuz now i have kids and a house and everything but like i would i i can't survive as a creative person, I can't survive in that kind of environment. So, so long as I'm still inspired by people, I'm still going to keep doing this. But you still have to feel the inspiration as well. Like it's, it still has to be meaningful to you for it to be worthwhile. Yeah. And you know, I, I also see it as a chance to work on my craft. Like I challenge myself on every single song. Like to get better at saying things without saying them or to get better at finding the the, just the exact right way of saying like how how like describing this person's experience so every like I'm never finished being challenged I'm never like good enough so that keeps me on my toes too have the offers or the 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 commissions come in fairly steadily or are there times when you're doing a lot more of this and then other times where you're kind of left without any of these uh to do or or how do, how do you keep it kind of how do you pace yourself and make sure that you have enough work to live on but you you don't over you don't take on too much you know what i mean yeah well i absolutely have taken on too much um <laughs> there there have been times where you know, because this is another thing, like, people have a deadline, like, you know, they're getting married this date, or there's their wedding anniversary is this date. And sometimes the creative process is mysterious. So I, I have like, I can have a formula for how I work. So, if, you know, my first step is gathering the information. And then I sit down at my piano for a couple hours and think of chords. And then the next step is this and this. But there are some times when I, I'm just stuck or I'm just empty or the, there's something else that's taking up too much space in my mind. So in those instances, I bring on a co-writer. I'll, I'll ask um, a fellow songwriter to come in and just having another super talented person in there with me. A lot of times, like, you know, they'll just say something that sparks or they'll give me a lyric or a melody and it, I'm good. I'm good to go. I just need help starting. But so... That has happened where I've I've overbooked myself, um, but yeah, they 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 seem to come in really steadily. As so long as I keep posting them, people keep people keep hiring me to write them. So yeah. So does this satisfy your creative urge, or do you still feel a desire or a need to write songs just for yourself, not somebody else's story, but you know, 
do you, do you still have that love or that appreciation of writing songs and that, that creative drive to do it just because? Yeah, I do. So that's, that's the other great thing about what we're doing. Um, my husband and I, we're doing, uh, we, we write songs for a publisher. So a lot of times our, our publisher will say, um, you know, we're looking for like this specific type of song or, or a song with this type of feel, but a lot of times too, they'll just say, you know, do you have any tracks? Like we'll take 10 tracks from you or something. And Jason and I essentially get to do whatever we want. So right now we're working on um, 10 brand new songs that have no, there's no parameters on them. It's like making an album for us. So that's, I, I still get to do that uh, and express my own thoughts and feelings. So yeah, it's, I definitely still have that drive. And it's still there. But, you know, like, my material for writing songs has really changed. Because now my life consists of, like, dropping my kids off at school and then trying to get back to emails and, like, picking them up at the end of the day. So, you know, there's, um, like, it's it's interesting now what, I, what I'm inspired by as opposed to when I wrote, like, my first or second album. I had, like, so many relationship you know, dramas or whatever to write songs about. So it's just different now, but yeah. And do you ever, do you ever feel the desire to, to do the concerts again or, you know, come and visit the people that you met here in Winnipeg or wherever and, and do those shows? Like, is that something that you would ever even consider? Like if the kids were, you know, older or more stable or if the opportunity presented itself, is that something that you still feel any desire to do? Absolutely. I have just started feeling that way. It's been like, you know, we left the road like eight years ago. And so it was funny during the pandemic. um, It wasn't funny. Sorry, it wasn't funny at all. But it was interesting during the pandemic to see all of our musician friends really, really miss the road and miss touring. And Jason, I said to Jason, like, do you miss touring? And he was like, I mean, yeah, it was really fun, but you know, you had such a hard time on the road and and I I would think, yeah, yeah, I don't miss touring. I'm really glad we have this now so the pandemic isn't really affecting us the same way it's affecting a lot of our friends. Um but yeah, I have recently especially at Christmas time because we always used to do a Christmas tour. And that was it was really fun. It was also super stressful traveling across Canada in the winter time. Um, a lot of times it was just me and Jason and not the ideal time. No, we were, it was just the two of us in a rental car and you know, Winnipeg. It's look, it's really cold. I'll never forget. Like the first time I was there in the winter, we were staying with our friends and it's like minus 30 outside. And I was like, I'm just going to go for a quick walk. And they were like, (laughs) they were like, you're not going to get past the driveway. And I was like, yes, I will. It's fine. I did not get past the driveway. I turned straight back around. I was, I can't feel my legs. I was outside for three seconds. Anyway. Yeah. So we do, I definitely miss there's specific spots and, and cities that we absolutely miss. Um, so yeah, but you know, touring it's, it's like really, it takes a lot of work. It's really expensive and it's like, it's hard on the environment too. So I think if we were to play again, it would, it would be very strategic and, um, but yes, that's the long, the super long answer. I, I do want to, I'm starting to want to play again. Yes. Um, and and do you think that like having success writing these songs for other people and knowing that getting that feedback from them and knowing that they're happy with what you've come up with, um, you know, does that, has that made you a, a more confident person? Does, does that lessen the anxiety of, you know, knowing that you can do this now? Like, like, do you feel more like you're better at, at doing this or, or knowing that you can, that you can do it successfully? Yeah. I mean, like I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist. Okay. But, but I have, because I have had anxiety basically my whole life, this is what I've realized. It wasn't touring. It wasn't any of these circumstances. It was, it was me. Like my whole life I've had anxiety. Um, I have really needed to work on my relationship with myself. 
and understand that if someone doesn't like what I'm doing, that's totally fine. Do I like what I'm doing? And if I do, and if I'm proud of myself, and if I'm proud of my efforts, and if I'm learning and growing, and I'm like meeting my own standards, that's that's good enough. That's that's good enough. But that's taken, you know, therapy and like a lot of journaling and lots of songwriting about like, you know, working through things. And um, I also, I take medication for my anxiety now too. And that really helps. That, that helps me. I still have those, those anxious thoughts, but it, it's like, I can, I can hear the logical side now. The logical side has equal voice as the anxiety side. So my anxiety side is coming up and it's like throwing all the shade at me. And then my logical side goes, okay, I hear that but do you remember we learned this and we've been working on this? And then I'm like, yeah, okay, right. So I can kind of move through it that way. So I've also like, you know, I've hired a personal trainer and I'm like work, you know, I do a lot of exercising to work out a lot of those feelings. So with all of these healthy mental health tools, I'd say that I've implemented in my medication and journaling and therapy and all these things, I've really, really improved my relationship with myself. And it, it doesn't affect me, I feel, as much now as what other people think of me as it did, say, when I was signed to the label or on tour. That's amazing. And it sounds like you have the, you, you know, the, the supports in place and, the, and the, you know, the, the healthy strategies to make sure that you're going to be okay, you know, and you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to burn yourself out again and you're going to be able to keep doing the things that you love and be successful at them. I think that's amazing. Yeah, I figured it all out. I have all the answers. <laughs> it's perfect now. <laughs> well, I should have asked you a long time ago. I could have cured myself too. You've got all the answers. That's great. <laughs> no, not at all. But I also think too, like, just having an awareness of it is so helpful too. Like, just being able to acknowledge it to myself and go like, oh yeah, like I have anxiety. Like, you know, it it got really, really bad for me. Like it, it got to this point where I'm not going to say that I was suicidal because I wasn't planning on killing myself at any time, but I was starting to have thoughts of like, you know, if I got a cancer diagnosis and it was terminal, in one way, in one really strange, sad way, I'd be okay with it because it would mean I'd get a break from this constant. And I mean, you talk about anxiety, like, do you have children, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. my anxiety I have for myself is like a trillion times worse when it comes to my kids. So if I worry about my own safety, I'm worried about their safety, like so much more than my own. And so, like, having kids has just been this huge, like, just anxiety bomb one after another of, like, triggers of my own childhood and, like, the world events. And I'm just, you know, constant, constant onslaught of anxiety. So I, I think when I, when I realized I was thinking thoughts like that and I, I heard myself wishing I could just somehow have a break, you know, cause I, I've never, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I understand why people end up there. Like if, you know, if you're just looking for a break from your brain, um, I, I get that. And I, I've n I never, you know, I never had any of those outlets that I was, I, I didn't ever do that. So I was just stuck in my head all the time and and I got to that point and I'm like, okay, what is actually wrong? Like I have an amazing husband. I've had multiple dream careers. I'm a successful songwriter. Like I have the most beautiful children, everything. I have everything. And I, I don't think I have to feel this way. And I, I'm really glad that I reached out. I started asking friends, actually. I started asking friends about it, their ex experiences with anxiety and realizing like, oh, I, yeah, it's, I don't feel anxiety. Like I have anxiety just all the time. I have it all the time. And understanding that there is a treatment for that. And it's not, it's not my fault. It's not like a shortcoming. It's not like 
I'm not smart enough to figure it out or I'm not grateful enough or, you know, it sort of removed all of this shame from me and the stigma. And I, I'm, I'm like able to help myself and therefore like my family and therefore like the world in a better way by showing up as somebody who, who can, I can take care of myself. And so I just, you know, I've, I've spoken to people since starting my medication too. Um, I've been talking to people really openly about it too and, and encouraging them to do what, you know, what they think is going to be best for them. Cause that really helped me. It's amazing how much anxiety you can have about your anxiety. <laughs> well, I mean, often the thing we're most anxious about is people finding out that we have anxiety, right? Like that's There's the, that that's too. often yeah. the biggest fear is like, I don't, I, I don't too. want anybody to know. Yeah. 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 I, I kind of don't care anymore. I, I guess that's why I'm on this podcast with you. I would rather live in a world where we can just talk openly about things and we can help each other. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. And I don't have, I don't have all the answers. I'm sorry, but I, I do feel, I do feel so much better now in my life. And I, I, you know, I just want to be a support for people who were like, or who are like I am, or I was, and just let people know that they're not alone and that there's resources and there's options. You don't have to stay in that place if you don't want to. Yeah. And I appreciate, I appreciate you giving me the chance to talk about it. I appreciate you facilitating conversations about it. I, I hat tip to you, my friend. Well, it's, uh, it's very important to me for, for all those reasons. And you, like I, I'm sure know, uh, musician friends who we've lost because they couldn't talk about it or mm-hmm. didn't or whatever. And, uh, it's, it just seems to be so rampant among creative people, especially, and, uh, maybe a little bit more awareness that, uh, you know, your friends are going through something similar might, you know, help to reduce some of that shame or that fear of telling somebody that you're having a hard time. Yeah, well, you know, when you're a creative person, like, I I think a lot of times those things can go hand in hand because the need to create, I, for me anyway, and for a lot of people I've spoken to about this, it comes from the need to exist in like some other type of reality. Like you, you need to like leave the one you're in and be in this other space an inside a song or a painting or a dance or you need you need like a different reality so like it's in a lot of ways it can stem from anxiety and so it's like we should have another chat about how to be creative without anxiety because that's a whole other thing that I'm I'm having to learn how to do now um that I never expected but yeah it's it's important to have a certain amount of need to create, but not, I wouldn't say at the expense of your mental health. No. And people like Simone Biles, you know, like her stand where she was like, no, I'm prioritizing my brain above people's entertainment and above gold medals. It's just like, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Prioritize your brain. You could never buy a new brain. You could never, you could, you could never you know, it's it's just inconceivable how incredible our brains are. It's, they're so there's nothing like them in the universe, and and taking care of them is really important. So yeah, I'm with you. It's really it's really wonderful what you're doing. In August, Megan made a post on her Facebook page that really made me want to talk to her for this show as soon as possible. I'll read it for you now and link to it at flywithyourshadow.com. She said, Oh, hi. So I have anxiety. It's hard for me to go outside sometimes. It's hard to be around people. It's just hard. I want to share this with anyone who feels alone in this. You're not alone. I'm starting to realize that it's not COVID. I've always been this way. I just got really good at ignoring huge parts of myself. I believed a prescribed religiosity so that I would be accepted at home. I followed a certain life path to be acceptable in various social groups. I allowed certain behaviors in order to maintain jobs and income. 
I allowed myself to be disrespected for my own physical safety. I stayed in hurtful relationships to get what I thought I needed. But the more I heal and the more I see how I've done what I've done to survive, I'm thankful that I have survived. And once I figure that part out, I can potentially see other ways of being. I don't have to betray myself to survive anymore. You don't have to either. Things that help me. Putting my toes in the sand. Supportive people like husband, sister, kids, friends. Putting my body in the water, preferably in an ocean or a lake, but friends who share pools are also my fave. Acknowledging and accepting the trauma in myself and others. Looking for ways to help and support other people and beings. Hugging and loving my kids and small fluffy puppies. Learning about boundaries and practicing making them. Therapy. Daily exercise. Good sleep. Balanced friendships. Healthy food and regular eating. Medication. As much nature as possible. It doesn't hurt all the time, but it hurts every day. If you feel this post, you're not alone. Don't stop trying. I'm here too. Wow, powerful words there. And that goes for me too. I understand and I'm here to help however I can. So please get in touch with me if you have any questions or feedback or need to talk. You can email me at flywithyourshadow at gmail.com. You can find out a lot more about Megan and her many creative endeavors at megansmith.com. That's M-E-A-G-H-A-N-S-M-I-T-H.com. Her music is available on all major streaming platforms and can be purchased on iTunes. She's got a website for her art and design work, including some of the most creative and amazing greeting cards you'll ever see at megansmithart.com. You can check out Megan's custom song business and perhaps even order your own at oursongmusic.com. Remember that purchasing music or merchandise directly from an artist allows them to survive by doing what they love. So I hope that you might support Megan or any of the talented artists that I've had on this show so far. Just a reminder, this show is always ad-free and costs you nothing. If you do want to help, please share this episode with someone who might enjoy it. Your help would be greatly appreciated. My name is Jeff Robson. I thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of the show, and I hope you'll join me again on the next episode of Fly With Your Shadows.